Hi. So today we're going to cover the tibia, knee, and patella. Um, you'll do plenty of knee exams uh, if you haven't already, just because of the nature of injuries and pain from arthritis. Uh, some people are carrying too much weight, experience knee problems. So of the three, you'll probably be doing the knee the most. Tib fibs, um, you'll be doing those occasionally, usually for lower leg injuries like shin splints, uh, maybe some um, Osgood Schlatter's disease in young kids, but you can do it for a variety of reasons, including car accidents or sports injuries. There's two main bones of the lower part of the leg, the tibia, which is going to be the medial bone, and the fibula, which is going to sit, fibula, which will sit a little bit laterally. Um, the tibia is larger than the fibula and the more anterior, so it sits a little bit more in front than the fibula as well. Um, the weight-bearing bone is the tibia. You can get by without the fibula. It just really kind of um, helps lock the ligaments and place them on the sides and kind of bring a little bit more balance and um, balance to the joints and such. Um, just some anatomy that we have. You are going to have a lateral and medial condyle. It's going to be based on this uh, anatomic position. Tibial tuberosity, which you see is number three. There's a small bump that you're going to feel on the very anterior portion of the bone. You can usually feel it just below your kneecap. Um, it's a little bit of a raised ridge um, right on there. You can see that radiographically pretty well too. Uh, medial malleolus, lateral malleolus are going to be at the bottom. That's going to make up the ankle joint like we learned last week. And the head of the fibula is actually going to be on the proximal portion or superior. <coughs> Excuse me. Super There's just some additional diagrams that you can look. Um, what you should note here is that there is a proximal tibiofibular joint as well as a distal tibiofibular joint. So you have to be specific when you're um, talking about the joint spaces there. Uh, first image, the AP tib fib. Um, it'll be at 40 inches. Typically, you can go a little bit higher on the SID if you need to, especially with longer legs, but usually 40 inches. Tabletop, uh, it's going to be on a small focal spot. You are going to use a 14 by 17 cassette, but you are going to have a diagonal orientation like you see here. So you're going to go from one corner to another corner, and just because that's going to give you a little bit more length, which you typically need to get the entire joint space of the tibia on there, and then both malleoli at the distal end. Uh, lateral tip fib, um, pretty much the same. Um, you're just going to center mid part of the leg. Just make sure you include both joints. A lot of times students will overestimate the amount of space they have proximally or more superior. So you want to just concentrate on where the lateral and medial malleolus are. If those are on the edge of the cassette in the corner, you'll typically don't just make sure that this is lined up properly and you'll get the entire knee joint on there. But you typically see a lot more misses down low than you do up high. Fractures, you need to get um, significant fractures from sports-related injuries. If, you remember, if you're an Angels fan, you remember this Grand Slam walk-off or home run that won the game. He came down on home plate and actually broke his leg and was gone for the season. And that's the uh, manager right there with his opinion. Tibial rotting is typically the course of treatment for this. Um, depending on how bad and how severe the leg are, um, leg is broken, and whether both of them are broken, they can put... Um, a rod right down the middle, what they do is they'll bend the knee a little bit here, they'll drill out the cortex um, in the surgical ward, and then they'll basically hammer in this rod all the way down. X-ray part of it is going to make sure that that is going through the bone and it's not going at a weird angle where it's going out to the side and maybe further breaking the bone. Once the bone is in to the orthopedic satisfaction, they'll usually put a couple screws to anchor it in, and then the bone should heal its, itself in six to eight weeks normally. Um, they can put these little spikes around on the bottom with the thinner bones. Obviously, you can't rod this bone because it's not thick enough to do that. Um, external fixators on the outside, they're doing some bone lengthening. Um, typically, if they're doing bone lengthening, uh, which is a completely voluntary kind of surgery to kind of add height, is that they will cut the bones, they will space them apart, and then new bone will grow in between these spaces, and then you'll actually have a little bit of added height. You obviously have to do it to both sides, um, uh, both legs, to make sure that everything is not off kilter. AP knee, 40 inches, small focal spot again. This is going to be in the table bucket, though. Um, you can do these tabletop, but you have much more success doing them inside the bucket to kind of clean up the image a little bit more. You're getting a little bit thicker towards the knee and more proximally than you are going distally on the tip bib, where it's still relatively thin, but you don't need to have a grid.
I'm using 10 by 12 cassette lengthwise. Central ray is going to be a half inch distal to the apex of the patella. So the apex of the patella is right here, this little point. Half inch to that should put you right over the joint space, which gives you an equal amount of femur, an equal amount of tip fib. Make sure that you're shielding. Um, in the old days, they used to teach a 5 to 7 degree cephalic angle to kind of get into this joint space a little bit more, but that's a little bit uh, dated in terms of uh, what's happening nowadays. Uh, rotate the leg in 3 to 5 degrees. Typically, the leg will fall towards the outside when they're lying down on their back, so you want to make sure that the kneecap is right in the middle of the femur. So it's just a general slight rotation of the leg towards the inside. Leg should be fully extended. Equal amounts to fib, femur should see the outline of the patella. You're not going to see completely the patella without any superimposition because it is behind the bone, but you should be able to make out the edges of it pretty well. Lateral knee, 40 inches, same thing. Um, CR about an inch distal to the epicondyle, um, the epicondyle. So above the condyle here, so you have your up epicondyle. Really, if you just look at where the bend in the knee is, is really where you're going to center um, your central ray on there. You're going to use a five to seven degree cephalic angle. The reason for that is the medial condyle is slightly bigger than the lateral condyle, so you need to angle up to get under that medial condyle and to line up both of these condyles so it looks like one condyle. If you have these horizontal lines superimposed on the bottom of the condyles, that means you use the proper angle. Flex the leg about 10, uh, 20 to 30 degrees, so not a full bend, just enough to kind of relax it so that you can manipulate it pretty well. Equal amounts of the tip, fib, and femur, just like on the AP, superimposed both condyles. Sponge should be in front of the affected knee, so I don't approve of having the leg behind like this because you can see the soft tissue of the other leg in the way. You would put a flat sponge right over here and then you would move this knee all the way out in front so that it's up and over and out of the way. Rotation errors, this is probably the most critical slide of this entire PowerPoint. Um, you need to be able to fix your rotated images. So you need to be able to figure out if your image is over rotated or under rotated. And there's two key areas to look for that. One of those areas is called the adductor tubercle. And the adductor tubercle is going to be on the medial condyle. There's no adductor tubercle on the lateral condyle. So if you know that it's on the medial condyle, you'll know which one of these condyles is which. The other important area is the head of the fibula. So as you look at the head of the fibula, normal position should be that it is slightly tucked behind um, the posterior portion of the tibia. Okay? Um, if it's tucked all the way underneath, Generally, that means it's a little bit under-rotated. You need to raise the knee up, or the heel up a little bit, kind of rotating the knee down. And then this head of the fibula will pop out a little bit more in its proper position. If you see the adductor tubercle in profile, like you see here, it's the same thing. This means it's a little bit under-rotated. You need to lift the heel up a little bit. And this adductor tubercle should be lined up with the rest of the bone going across on here. Now if you have the opposite problem where the heel is up too high, the adductor tubercle is going to be in front of the back portion of the femur and it won't line up. What will also happen on the opposite side of the leg with the head of the fibula is that it might be out all by itself. And if it's out all by itself, typically it means it's over rotated a little bit too much. We'll explain these a little bit and give you plenty of samples in the film evaluation in class as well. Internal oblique knee, um, you're going to do a medial oblique typically just to see the head of the fibula here. We want to get the tibia away from this bone here so that we can see if there's any potential fractures in here. So a lot of times we do this for trauma. Um, centering is going to be just like the AP. There's no angle on this. You're going to rotate the leg medially about 45 degrees. What you need to do first though is you need to bend the good knee out of the way, which will automatically turn the hip slightly and make it easier for the patient to roll into this 45 degree angle. Tunnel view of the knee, this is the Holmblad method. There are many, many ways to do the tunnel view of the knee. So the way I'm going to show you in class, because it generally gives you the most um, efficient, um, less distorted image of all the Holmblad, or all the uh, tunnel views, sorry. I'm going to do a 10 by 12 cassette. We're going to go table bucky. I know that this shows it on tabletop, but it really should be on the table bucky. Lengthwise again, PA projection is going to be kneeling with the affected leg inferior. So what's going to happen is you're going to have the patient on all fours, you're going to have them on their hands, both knees. You're going to slide the good knee forward so they're balancing more on that and taking pressure off of their bad knee. 
and you should be bent about 60 to 70 degrees so if they're bent at 90 degrees all you have them do is just lean forward a little bit and then you shoot straight down right into the tunnel what you should see is the intercondylar fossa that's going to show up right through here you're not going to see this on the AP view because of the way it's orientated should still be able to shield the patient area of interest as we said intercondylar fossa no rotation or superimposition of the patella so the patella should be right in the middle let you know that they're not leaning towards one way or the other and you should have this little type of mouse hole if you will seen uh, right in the middle of your image there's some alternate views uh, we're not going to cover all of these but the uh, the clear method is one way to do it you do have to kind of build it up with towels here this is going to be a tabletop view um, you have to get the angles just right so that means you have to get the leg angle correct and then you have to get the tube angle correct to get the tunnel view open on this it's going to have the most distortion um, of any of the alternate views. Uh, Camp Coventry method. This is a PA view. This is a relatively easy position to hold as well. Patient's just going to lie on their stomach. You're going to flex about 40 to 50 degrees. Just use a big old sponge to kind of rest their feet on. Um, you're going to do this again in the table bucky, not tabletop. Angle the tube about 50, 40 degrees on there to kind of match that up. More distortion is going to be seen on this a little bit because you have a straight part, but you have a pretty severe angle on here. Weight bearing, PA bad lateral on these. This is just a semi flex view. Um, there's something called the Rosenberg, which is similar to this, but it's going to kind of open up the intercondylar fossa a little bit more. If you look at the diagram, sometimes it's just a little bit, makes a little bit more sense to do a PA with a slight bend because you can actually see through the space a little bit better on the PA. So if you do a PA instead of AP standing in your clinics, this is the most likely reason why. Pathology, Osgood Slatter's disease, it's usually seen in adolescence, so like 12 to like 15, 16 years old. Um, overuse injury, not so much of a disease. Um, tibial tuberosity starts to pull away from the body of the tibia. So what you're going to see is this little bump, not which isn't to be confused with the kneecap, but you're going to see this little kind of hard bump across here. This is just the tibial tuberosity kind of pulling away from the rest of the bone and kind of creates this little hump in here. Um, usually, you just have to back off the exercise and they usually kind of will just grow out of it. Osteochondroma, this is just benign bone growth. It can cause problems depending on size. Um, it has a coat, line, coat hanger like appearance. So you may see it kind of towards the edge of the bone going out this way and then it goes you know, this way on the lateral. You can really see how it angles superiorly pretty well. Um, you may see a noticeable bump along the skin line. Most people don't even know that they have them. Um, it can stretch out the ligaments and the muscles because it has to kind of go around these osteochondromas. So it can cause itself to be a little bit of pain is one of the symptoms on there. Osteoarthritis. About 15 million Americans have osteoarthritis in their knees and could help. Could be helped with either a full or partial knee replacement. So we do tons and tons of knee replacements because patients are basically losing the cartilage within that spacing of the knee. Once that happens, it starts to affect the hip a little bit higher. It can affect the opposite knee as well. It can generally lead to back problems, so it's better to get it taken care of sooner rather than later. It's kind of what the knee replacements look like. You're just going to cut away part of the knees and put these little metal portions on that. The uh, inferior portion is just going to connect to the superior portion of the tibia. It's just going to kind of be hammered in. This part actually has to be cut and like adhered into the distal end of the femur. Uh, some toe anatomy, um, just the apex is at the bottom, the base will be at the top. Patellar views are just going to be a straight PA normally. Uh, you just really want to get the patella on there. We're putting the part as close to the image as possible, so it makes sense to do a PA rather than AP. Lateral patella, just a sideways view on there. Just a little bit of flex in the knee, not as much as the lateral knee. Tangential views. These are really called the Sunrise, Merchant, Skyline. There's a whole bunch of names for them. But basically, we want to see the space between the patella and the kneecap on here. And we'll show you our preferred ways in class. Tangential view. This is one way to do it. Some other views. The Houston and Setagas. It's really the only thing that changes is the angle on here. So pay attention to the angles on this. Fractured patella. You can see that the patella is in two pieces on here. Uh, you can do cross table views if needed to be because the patients probably won't be able to move that much. There's some other miscellaneous things on here that you can look over. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to ask us in class.